path we have chosen for the present is full of hazard, as all paths are. But it is the one most consistent with our character and courage as a nation and our commitments around the world. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere, and we hope around the world. God willing, that goal will be achieved. November 11, 1963, Veterans Day. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy and his son John Jr. visited the tomb of the unknown soldier. Two weeks later, Sergeant Keith Clark would once again play taps for the president, who would take his place among the heroes at Arlington National Cemetery. The Thousand Days. President Kennedy's thousand days in office brought a new style to the White House and a new image to Washington. Jacqueline Kennedy, with her taste for beauty and refinement, created a mood of simple splendor at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Elegance, youth, warmth emanated from the decorous presidential mansion. Culture and history filled the ballrooms as music, art, and theater created a mood of elevated entertainment at White House dinners and receptions. The President and the First Lady cultivated finesse and charm as they honored dignitaries, intellectuals, and artists from all over the world. Jackie redecorated the White House with period pieces that reflected the history and the traditions of many presidencies. For the first time since Theodore Roosevelt was president, children lived in the White House. The first family caught the public imagination as the presidency came to be associated with more than politics and diplomacy. Indeed, the image of the country was changing. People all over the world flocked to see the American they adored and his wife whom they adored even more. How long had it been since a United States president had received such welcomes abroad? In substance, too, Kennedy set a new image for the White House. For his cabinet and staff, he chose dynamic, capable men, men of intellect, wit, and elegance. Some were recruited from prestigious universities, such as Harvard and Yale. Others were leaders of industry, or presidents of philanthropic foundations. Still others were distinguished statesmen. Most were young. All became the new frontiersmen. They were, in Kennedy's words, the brightest and the best. But this is a, a very exciting period, and everyone in Washington tells me that uh, there's going to be a, a new era, which is good news for everybody at home as well as around the world. The president's commitment to public service was embodied in the Peace Corps. When John Kennedy entreated Americans to ask what they could do for their country, he motivated a whole generation. Thousands of Americans volunteered to go overseas, working and living with the people of developing countries, serving in the fields of health, education, agriculture, and construction. Kennedy appointed his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, to head the Peace Corps. Shriver was dedicated to this project but he first had to answer the charges of nepotism. You know, I don't know anything about any Peace Corps. And he said, well, that's all right, neither does anybody else. And I said, but yes, but remember all the political debts you incurred during the campaign. Why don't you give this uh, job to one of your political friends? <clears throat> he said, listen, Sarge, the truth of the matter is that everybody thinks the Peace Corps is going to be one of the greatest fiascos in history. If it turns out that way, it's much easier to fire a relative than a political friend. <laughs> This is a voluntary effort 
Most of you, I understand. The first group of volunteers set off for Africa. You spend uh, your time in a good many uh, countries living under conditions of hardship. All of you go to a continent about which we know very little. So I want you to know that in going to Africa, you represent the best of our country. And uh, I know they will welcome you. And I think that uh, you will have the feeling of having served this country uh, uh, and in a broader sense, the free community of people uh, in a very crucial time. It's very easy to make speeches about what uh, ought to be done about this country and how it can be improved. I hear them all the time. But you, at least, are picking up your bags and going someplace and doing something. And that's why we're glad to have you. Doing something was the theme of the new Kennedy administration and the Peace Corps its most eloquent proponent. In Latin America, too, the hijos de Kennedy, children of Kennedy, were welcomed with open arms. Latin America was at a turning point when President Kennedy and the First Lady arrived in Venezuela in 1961. Kennedy proposed that North and South America join together in an alliance for progress. The United States would seek to support democracy, to aid in programs of land reform and economic stabilization and to stimulate exchange and cooperation between the two continents. One of the uh, Kennedys uh, does not need an interpreter, so I'd like to have my wife uh, say just a word uh, to you. A unos pocos afortunados. Both abroad and at home, people everywhere could not get their fill of the Kennedy children. Little John Jr. may have been more of a Bouvier than a Kennedy when it came to rough sports. Caroline tried to take after her mother's artistic temperament, not always with success. A priority for Jack and Jackie was budgeting time to be with their children. If you bungle raising your children, Jackie said, I don't think whatever else you do well matters very much. Ninety miles off the coast of Florida lay Cuba, an island governed by the communist leader Fidel Castro. In 1960, President Eisenhower entrusted the CIA to plan an overthrow of Castro's regime. Cuba would be invaded by CIA-trained and armed Cuban exiles. The U.S. would provide covert air support. The CIA plan for the secret invasion was disclosed to Kennedy after his election. He was briefed by Eisenhower the day before his inauguration. Eisenhower reminded Kennedy that it was the new administration's responsibility to do whatever necessary to make the Cuban invasion successful. General Maxwell Taylor later surmised that Kennedy must have felt that if the plan were approved by General Eisenhower, the greatest military man in America, it must have been militarily sound. Kennedy was soon to discover the contrary. Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara and Secretary of State Dean Rusk were among the Joint Chiefs of Staff and White House advisors 
the brightest and the best who attended a crucial meeting on April 4, 1961. As the invasion was a CIA operation, the Pentagon did not perform a complete military study. Misinformed by the CIA and poorly briefed by his advisors, Kennedy was about to learn a harsh lesson. Kennedy's cabinet and advisors agreed to the mission, although Senator William Fulbright, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, had characterized the invasion as immoral and illegal. The son of Joseph Kennedy bred to be tough and courageous, feared seeming soft. Yet he would not publicly commit his administration to the illegal invasion, even though he admired the direct, decisive style of the CIA. On April 12th, Kennedy spoke to reporters. Well, first I want to say that there will not be under any conditions be an intervention in Cuba by the United States Armed Forces. And this government will do everything it possibly can, and I think it can meet its responsibilities to make sure that there are no Americans involved in any action inside Cuba. 1,500 Cuban exiles were trained by the CIA. But when they landed on Cuba, they were attacked by Castro's Air Force. The Cuban leader personally directed the defense of the Bay of Pigs. The invaders looked toward the U.S. for backup. Kennedy secretly agreed to send in six unmarked Navy jets. But the air support was insufficient. Castro's forces soon contained the attack, pushing the insurgents into the sea and strafing the beaches. More than a thousand Cuban invaders were taken prisoner. They were eventually released in exchange for $50 million in supplies and $3 million in cash. Kennedy realized too late that mismanagement, hesitation, and fundamental errors in moral judgment resulted in the greatest fiasco of his presidency. The CIA would continue to plot Castro's assassination throughout Kennedy's administration, going so far as to hire Mafia help. Kennedy was left alone to decide how to deal with his first failure. He hadn't questioned the basic morality of the invasion. Instead, he had worried more about concealing the U.S. involvement. He finally chose to be gallantly honest. I bear the responsibility of the presidency of the United States. And it is my duty to make decisions that no advisor and no ally can make for me. It is my obligation and responsibility to see that these decisions are as informed as possible, that they are based on as much direct, first-hand knowledge as possible. The days of work and worry in the White House were balanced with moments of recreation. The Kennedys enjoyed sailing with friends on their yacht, the Honey Fitz, named after Jack's grandfather. While Kennedy was growing swiftly into his responsibilities as Commander-in-Chief, his son John Jr. was trying to learn from his father's mistakes. When steering in dangerous waters, keep your eyes open. Surrounded by family and friends, though never far from the problems and decisions he faced as president, Kennedy was perhaps happiest in the free, open breeze of the sea. The children were playful, unafraid of the sea. And if they could not attract the attention of the dutiful captain concentrated on the safety of his illustrious passengers, they were sure to have moments of frolic and affection with their father. During his 1961 trip to France, Kennedy had no illusions about resolving differences with French President Charles de Gaulle, but he was intent on developing a rapport with the man he admired so much. General de Gaulle, the proud leader of the Free French during World War II, agreed completely with Kennedy on defending West Berlin. 
but on the matter of defense and the NATO alliance, their views diverged. Though much was not resolved, the Paris talks did highlight the respect that had brought together an impatient, energetic new frontiersman and an aging European traditionalist. But the trip did bring a sensation sweeping through Paris. The city buzzed with excitement at Jacqueline Kennedy's every appearance. The Kennedys were honored at a dinner and ballet performance at the Versailles Palace. The grace, poise, and intelligence of America's First Lady impressed and charmed both the French people and President de Gaulle. Kennedy summed up the impact of the trip to his French hosts at a press luncheon. I do not uh, think it altogether inappropriate to introduce myself to this audience. I am the man who accompanied Jacqueline Kennedy uh, to Paris, and I've enjoyed it. In June 1961, Kennedy met with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna. In public, the Soviet leader's attention was more riveted on Jackie than the president. Photographers asked for a shot of the two men shaking hands. Khrushchev pointed to Mrs. Kennedy and said, I'd rather shake hands with her. The two men disagreed on nearly all issues. Khrushchev was determined to support wars of national liberation, claiming that the spread of communism was inevitable. Kennedy was dedicated to defending West Berlin and keeping West Germany free of Soviet aggression. When Khrushchev explained to Kennedy that the medal he was wearing was the peace medal, the president replied, I hope you get to keep it. Kennedy's report to the nation upon his return was somber. The world knows that there is no reason for a crisis over Berlin today and that if one develops, it will be caused by the Soviet Union and their government's attempt to invade the rights of others and manufacture tensions. East Berliners had long found remarkable ways to escape to the West. Berlin was a city with a history of pain, a city that lived with a daily reminder of the price of freedom. An isolated island within East Germany, West Berlin persisted despite the tragedy of its geography and the miracle of its survival. On August 13, 1961, East Germany began to build the Berlin Wall. In the preceding two weeks, thousands of East Berliners had escaped to West Berlin. Others were to be forever separated from friends and family. Kennedy called the wall an offense against humanity. He also sent 1,500 American soldiers into West Berlin, a reminder to Khrushchev that the U.S. seriously meant to defend the free city. In 1961, President Kennedy called for an increase of nearly $3.5 billion in America's defense budget and an addition of 217,000 men to the armed forces. Throughout his term, Kennedy spoke of the dangers of nuclear arms and became more and more committed to living peacefully with the Soviets. Negotiating with Western Europe and the Soviet Union for a treaty that would ban all nuclear tests, except those performed underground, Kennedy announced that he would take the first step in a speech that he delivered at American University in Washington, D.C. on June 10, 1963. To make clear our good faith and solemn convictions on this matter, I now declare that the United States does not propose to conduct nuclear tests in the atmosphere so long as other states do not do so. This generation of Americans has already had enough more than enough of war and hate and oppression. In 1963, the U.S., Britain, and the Soviet Union signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Khrushchev later wrote of Kennedy with respect, saying he showed himself to be sober-minded and determined to avoid war. The thousand days of the Kennedy administration brought a notable change to Washington's social life and to entertainment at the White House diplomatic receptions took on an aura of elegance and decorum as the arts flourished. Pablo Casals, a renowned cellist, broke his vow never to give concerts in any country that recognized the fascist Franco regime. 
Benny Goodman was another in the steady stream of accomplished musicians, artists, writers, and poets to perform at the White House. Music, theater, ballet, opera. Soon an appearance at the White House conferred special status on an artist, for only those of excellence were invited. On January 8, 1963, the first American showing of Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa took place at Washington's National Gallery of Art. Jacqueline Kennedy had arranged with France's Minister of Culture, noted novelist and philosopher André Malraux, for the loan of the famous painting. Malraux and his wife joined the Kennedys at the opening. In one of his speeches, Kennedy stated, when power leads man towards arrogance, poetry reminds him of his limitations. In the early 60s, whites-only signs in the South taunted America's claim of being a nation with liberty and justice for all. The civil rights movement concentrated on two issues, desegregation and the registration of blacks to vote. On May 4, 1961, the first two busloads of freedom riders, men and women, black and white, set out on a mission of nonviolence to challenge the segregation laws by breaking them. In Alabama, the riders were ferociously beaten, sometimes crippled by hundreds of armed whites. Finally, Attorney General Robert Kennedy sent in federal marshals. We are planning uh, during the course of this afternoon to send in uh, several hundred uh, more uh, U.S. marshals from around the country to help and assist. The uh, number of the marshals that are been there now haven't uh, had much sleep in the last uh, 48 hours, and it's to relieve that situation and also uh, be available in case there are any other problems or difficulties as there was uh, last evening. How effective do you feel that the marshals were in the action last night? Well, I don't think there's any question that they saved a uh, number of lives and uh, prevented uh, widespread uh, bloodshed. While the Civil Rights Commission and the Justice Department amassed evidence of gross discrimination, traditionally white institutions were desegregated by federal order. In the fall of 1962, Mississippi exploded in violence when Governor Ross Barnett refused to let a black register at the university. The president was prompted to make his first nationwide appeal for civil rights. Americans are free and sure to disagree with the law, but not to disobey it. For any government of laws and not of men, no man, however prominent or powerful, and no mob, however unruly or boisterous, is entitled to defy a court of law. James Meredith, the black Air Force veteran, had applied to the university, inspired by Kennedy's inaugural speech. But the president had to send federal troops to protect Meredith. In Alabama, Governor George Wallace was not intimidated by court orders. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. From unrest in Birmingham, public attention shifted to Tuscaloosa when Governor Wallace announced that he would physically bar the admission of two black students to the University of Alabama. In a gesture of defiance, Wallace stood at the university door until the federalized Alabama National Guard, under orders from the Attorney General, commanded him to leave. The governor had made his point. Wallace now complied, and the University of Alabama was desegregated. James Hood and Vivian Malone entered the university in 1963, marking the end of the state's defiance of federal courts. Fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades, and protests, which create tensions and threaten violence and threaten lives. We face, therefore, a moral crisis as a country and a people. We have a right to expect that the Negro community will be responsible, will uphold the law, but they have a right to expect that the law will be fair, that the Constitution will be colorblind, as Justice Harlan said at the turn of the century. This is what we're talking about, and this is a matter which concerns this country and what it stands for. 
On August 28, 1963, a quarter of a million people marched on Washington in support of civil rights. They assembled at the Lincoln Memorial to hear Martin Luther King Jr. deliver one of his most famous speeches in which he shared his vision of a future America. President Kennedy sent a strong civil rights bill to Congress, but he would not live to see it enacted. The Kennedys often spent weekends at their rented estate, Glen Ora, in Middleburg, Virginia. Caroline had her own pony. It was named Macaroni. Jackie herself was an accomplished horsewoman. As a child, she had won equestrian competitions on Long Island in New York. Caroline seemed to take after her mother. In these instances, the men of the family stood by and watched while the women displayed their dynamic skills. yet unexplored was space. Kennedy was concerned that the U.S. was lagging behind the Soviets. Ever since their historic launching of Sputnik in 1957, Kennedy urged America to beat its rival in technology and space exploration. In the late 50s, the United States space program was unprepared for significant expeditions beyond the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, it was having trouble getting off the ground. On April 12, 1961, the first man was successfully launched into outer space. He was a Soviet and his name was Yuri Gagarin. He orbited the Earth in 90 minutes. America was still behind, but catching up fast. Less than a month after Gagarin's triumph, Commander Alan B. Shepard, a Navy test pilot, became the first American to go into space. Launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida, Shepard rocketed 115 miles above the Earth in a 15-minute flight that elated the country. Kennedy, watching on television with Vice President Johnson, head of the Space Council, knew what his goal would be, a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to express uh, on behalf of us all the great pleasure we have in welcoming Commander Shepard and Mrs. Shepard here today. I know that the... Uh, other members of this team who are astronauts know uh, that our pride in them is equal. They have been part of this effort from the beginning. 
And I think it does uh, credit to him that he is associated with such a distinguished group of Americans whom we are all glad to honor today, his uh, companions in the uh, flight to outer space. So I think we'll give them all a hand. They are the tanned and healthy ones. The others are Washington uh, employees. <laughs> I also want to again express my congratulations uh, to Alan Shepard. Uh, we're uh, very proud of him. And I speak on behalf of uh, the Vice President, who is Chairman of our Space Council and who bears great responsibilities in this field, the members of the House and Senate Space Committee who are with us today, and uh, this decoration, which has gone from the ground up here. <laughs> And from the ground up they went. The next space spectacular was part of Project Mercury, an American program that aimed at space exploration. On February 20th, 1962, Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn orbited the Earth three times. In just under five hours, the 40-year-old astronaut gave the U.S. space program its first real leap forward. In September 1962, Kennedy gave new impetus to the space race. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. President Kennedy rarely found humor out of place, even at such a venerable institution as Yale University, where he received an honorary doctorate in 1962. It might be said now that I have the best of both worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. <laughs> I am particularly glad to become a Yale man because as I think about my troubles, I find that a lot of them have come from other Yale men. In 1963, Kennedy honored comedian Bob Hope with the Congressional Gold Medal for Service to the Cause of Democracies. Of the Congress to present this to you. What a splendid picture of you. <laughs> I hope everyone had a chance to look at it and present it to you on behalf of the people of the United States. Thank you very much, Mr. President. That's very nice. I suggested to Senator Symington that I should have had a nose job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he said there would have been less gold, so... Uh... <laughs> but I actually uh, don't like to... Uh tell jokes about a thing like this because it's uh, one of the nicest things that's ever happened to me and I feel very humble. Although I think I have the strength of character to fight it. I, uh, <laughs> and I want to say that I also played in the South Pacific while the president was there and he was a very gay, carefree young man at that time. Of course, all he had to worry about then was the enemy. <laughs> His press conferences were the setting for much of Kennedy's wittiest humor. Press Secretary Pierre Salinger figured prominently. They criticized uh, Mr. Salinger as a, quote, young and inexperienced White House publicity man, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> I questioned the advisability of having him visit the Soviet Union. I wonder if you have any comments. I know there are always some people who feel that Americans are always uh, young and inexperienced and foreigners are always uh, able and tough and great negotiators, but I don't think that the United States acquired its present position of leadership uh, in the free world uh, if that uh, view were correct. Now, he also, as I saw the press, said that Mr. Salinger's main job was to uh, increase uh, my standing in the Gallup poll. Having done that, he's now moving on uh, to... Uh, President, it's been a long time since we've had a definitive 
report on your health from the best possible source. <coughs> How is your aching back? <laughs> well, it depends on the weather, political and otherwise. <laughs> I wonder if you could tell us whether, if you had it to do over again, you would uh, work for the presidency and whether you can recommend the job to others. Uh, well, the answer is, uh, the first is yes, and the second is no. I don't recommend it to others. <laughs> At least for a while. A political question, sir. The Republicans are holding leadership conferences around the country, including here in Washington today, with the purpose of upsetting the democratic balance of power in the congressional elections that are coming up. Would you care to comment on the task these Republican teachers have and with what hope they might look towards success in the fall? <laughs> no. no, I think that uh, I'm sure that uh, I don't know who's giving the leadership direction, uh, but uh, I'm sure that they'll have a uh, very program. <laughs> It's been a long time since the president and his family have been subject to such, to such a heavy barrage of teasing and fun poking and satire. I mean, there have been books on backstairs at the White House and cartoon books with clever sayings and uh, uh, photo albums with uh, balloons and the, and the rest, and now a uh, smash hit record. Can you tell us uh, whether you read and listen to these things and whether they produce Annoyment or enjoyment? <laughs> <laughs> Annoyment. Uh, no, they produce. Uh, I, yes, I have read them and listened to them. Actually, I listened to Mr. Meader's record, but I thought it sounded more like Teddy than it did me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, newspaper woman May Craig often criticized the president. Her comments on the freedom of the press and the administration's treatment of news items were to the point. Perhaps you tell us what uh, it is that you object to in our treatment of the news. Are you asking me? Yes. <laughs> well, I don't believe in managed news at all. I thought we ought to get everything we want. Well, I think you should uh, do, Mr. Craig. I'm for that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, do you think that Mrs. Murphy should have to take into her home a lodger whom she does not want regardless of her reason, or would you ac accept a change in the Civil Rights Bill to accept small boarding houses like Mrs. Murphy? Yeah, the question would be, it seems to me, Miss Craig, whether Mrs. Murphy had a substantial impact on interstate commerce. On October 14, 1962, American intelligence sources produced aerial photographs of an offensive arms buildup in Cuba. Kennedy acted decisively, and on October 22nd, he spoke to the nation about the Cuban Missile Crisis, extending an ultimatum to the Soviet Union. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Acting therefore in the defense of our own security, and of the entire Western Hemisphere, I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. While a terrified world anxiously waited in fear of impending nuclear war, Kennedy and his advisors conferred. 
He promised Khrushchev not to attack Cuba if the Soviets under UN supervision would dismantle the bases and return the missiles to the Soviet Union. Khrushchev had counted on a weak American president who after the Bay of Pigs fiasco could easily be intimidated. But confronted with Kennedy's firmness, the Soviet leader backed down. I have uh, today been informed by Chairman Khrushchev that all of the IL-28 bombers now in Cuba will be withdrawn in 30 days. He also agrees that these planes can be observed and counted as they leave. Inasmuch as this goes a long way towards reducing the danger which faced this hemisphere four weeks ago, I have this afternoon instructed the Secretary of Defense to lift our naval quarantine. Some Americans defended Castro. One member of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee distributed leaflets in New Orleans. His name was Lee Harvey Oswald. You consider yourself a Marxist? Well, I would very definitely say that I, uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. But I, that does not mean, however, I'm a, a uh, communist. Whatever the success or failure of their political actions, Jack and Bobby Kennedy always had a triumphant welcome when they came home. Most of the children in the growing Kennedy clan ran up to Bobby, but two of them claimed the president. The child that Jackie was bearing, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, would die two days after his premature birth. Photo sessions with the Kennedys were always a record for posterity. Southeast Asia had long been of special interest to Kennedy. In the 50s, he had criticized colonial regimes that were not backed by the people. But in 1960, the State Department and the CIA had helped engineer a rightist coup in Laos. The U.S. and the Soviets ended up supporting opposing factions. We strongly and unreservedly support the goal of a neutral and independent Laos, tied to no outside power, or group of powers, threatening no one, and free from any domination. Fearing communist reprisals from China and North Vietnam upon the entire region, Kennedy sent 100 military advisors and 400 Green Berets to South Vietnam in 1961. In May 1962, Kennedy's advisors convinced him to send U.S. troops to the Laotian border in Thailand. And it's also important because it borders the Mekong River, and quite obviously if Laos fell into communist hands, it would increase the danger along the northern frontiers of Thailand, would put additional pressure in Cambodia, and would put additional pressure in South Vietnam, which themselves would put additional pressure on Malaya. So I do accept the view that there is an interrelationship in these countries, and uh, that's why we're con one of the reasons why we're concerned with maintaining the Geneva Accords as a method of maintaining stability in Southeast Asia. General Douglas MacArthur warned the president, never, ever, ever, he said, put American soldiers on the mainland of Asia. But he did. Kennedy escalated American involvement in South Vietnam to meet the communist guerrilla threat. When South Vietnamese Prime Minister Diem and his brother Nu were assassinated in a military coup, the U.S. supported the military government. Kennedy bowed to his advisors, the brightest, but not always the best, the same men who had advised him on the Bay of Pigs were now urging U.S. military escalation in the struggle against Hanoi. However the South Vietnamese might have felt about Kennedy, the Irish unquestioningly adored him. When the American president went to visit Ireland in 1963, the entire country seemed to be out on the streets to greet him. A man in Kennedy's ancestral home of New Ross said with a smile, the pubs were open at 5 o'clock in the morning and most of the town was drunk by 8 for days on end. Kennedy was delighted and so were the Irish. There is an impression in Washington that there are no Kennedys left in Ireland, that they're all in Washington and uh, so I wonder if there are any uh, Kennedys in this audience. Could you hold up your hand so I can see? Well, I'm glad to see a few cousins who didn't catch the boat. We're glad to see The Irish were elated, for one of their own had made good.
If Ireland touched Kennedy's heart, it was his trip to Berlin that had fired his soul. From the square in Berlin that would later bear his name, Kennedy sent his daring message of freedom and solidarity. And there are even a few who say that it's true that communism is an evil system, but it permits us to make economic progress. Lass sie nach Berlin in common. Let them come. Free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. Kennedy's popularity was at a high. He was growing as a diplomat, overcoming the arrogance of believing that energy could be a substitute for wisdom and that pragmatism was more important than morality. He was coming to realize that for the world of the new frontier to succeed, competition had to be tempered by understanding. He planned for a second term with high hopes and determination to move more quickly toward achieving peace abroad and greater welfare at home. Once re-elected, he would see the Civil Rights Act passed by Congress. He would pull the U.S. out of Vietnam. He would further the cause of detente. And after eight years in the White House, he planned to travel and write and lecture for some time. Then he would settle down in Washington. But first, he had to go to Texas. He was repeatedly advised against the trip. None of the ominous warnings could change his mind. Many Democrats in Texas disagreed with Kennedy's liberal policies. Yet party discord seemed to melt away as Jack and Jackie appeared at a Chamber of Commerce breakfast in Fort Worth. Two years ago, I said that, uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. The presidential plane landed in Dallas at Love Field at 11.39 a.m. on November 22, 1963. As the motorcade left the airport for downtown Dallas, adoring crowds lined the streets to catch a glimpse of the president and first lady. One family prepared a banner hoping Kennedy would see it, and he did. Kennedy ordered his limousine to a halt, and he and Jackie shook hands with the Texans. The family cameraman did not realize that he was filming one of the last moments of a smiling President Kennedy. It, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. Just a moment, we have a bulletin coming in. We now switch you directly to Parkland Hospital. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as president by Judge Sarah T. Hughes on Air Force One. A few feet away lay the body of John F. Kennedy. Reserve. Sir. Peck. Peck. Stand. 
under the Constitution of the United States. The police were quick to search the Texas School Book Depository where they found the rifle that fired the fatal bullet. On November 22nd, one hour and 20 minutes after the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald was apprehended. I didn't shoot anybody, no sir. Two days later, on November 24th, television cameras were on hand as Oswald was being transferred from police headquarters to the Dallas County Jail. Nightclub owner Jack Ruby took his dubious place in history. As a horrified nation watched, the president's assassin was himself murdered. Why was this feeling, this sorrow, at once so universal and so individual, Britain's Harold Macmillan later asked? Was it not because he seemed in his own person to embody all the hopes and aspirations of this new world that is struggling to emerge, to rise, phoenix-like, from the ashes of the old. After the assassination, columnist Mary McGrory said to Assistant Labor Secretary Daniel Moynihan, we will never laugh again. Oh, Mary, Moynihan replied, we'll laugh again, but we'll never be young again. The essence of the Kennedy legacy, said Robert Kennedy of his older brother, is a willingness to try and to dare and to change, to hope for the uncertain and risk the unknown.
Jacqueline Kennedy lit the eternal flame that would forever burn upon her husband's grave, keeping the legacy of John Fitzgerald Kennedy alive. we have chosen for the present is full of hazards, as all paths are. But it is the one most consistent with our character and courage as a nation and our commitments around the world. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender or submission. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere. And we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. <laughs> 